On December 8th, 1980, I was assigned to the 20th Precinct. Uh, I was a patrolman in a radio car, and I got a call that there were shots fired at 1 West 72nd Street. Uh, there was a man pointing, and he said, that's the man doing the shooting. And at that point, we realized this is for real. So I peeked in and saw a man with his hands up. So I threw this guy up against the wall. And at that point, Jose says to me, he shot John Lennon. And I said, you what? This is a work of art by John Lennon's widow, Yoko Ono. I was thinking about all these windows in the world, and there's so many windows that have uh, uh, bullet marks, you know, bullet holes. So I wanted to make a symbolic gesture of one bullet hole for that. And also, you have to see it from the front, and you have to see it from the back, because when you see it from the front, you're the shooter. When you see it from the back, you're the victim. And I did it, and then I saw it and I said, oh my God, I saw that, that night. At 10.50 p.m. on Monday, December the 8th, 1980, John Lennon was murdered at the Dakota Building in New York. Late this evening, one of the world's great entertainers and musicians, John Lennon of the Beatles, was shot outside his New York home. The shock waves of John Lennon's murder were felt around the world. Imagine Switched on the radio, and Imagine was playing. You know, that was like a, a knife through your heart, you knew it was true. It was a shattering blow. Stunned. I just couldn't, I said, he, I just saw him. Total shock. Absol uh, absolute shock. Imagine all the people. And I could not believe it. I mean, I, I was shocked, and then I'm saying to myself, who did this, and why anyone would, would hurt John? Then, then it, it struck me that I might have a picture of the killer. In January 1969, 11 years before John died, the Beatles held their last ever concert on the roof of their office building in Savile Row. It was the end of an era. John Lennon profoundly influenced a generation and beyond. Cool. What do you know happened to you? What do I know happened? I don't know, the, the record thing was, the record label was run from here, wasn't it, I suppose? I don't know much what happened there. I wasn't born on that, but yeah, man, the gig, man, the last gig and that. See, this starts from McCartney there, isn't it? Lennon in the middle, Addison there, cool. Isn't it? I mean, it was voice, man. I mean, it makes me happy, makes me sad, makes me fucking angry, makes me chill, you know what I mean? It's his voice, really. I thought, right, I want to be in a band like that. I want to kind of make music like that. John's whole life, after he walked away from the Beatles, was an escape from the insanity of Beatlemania. In 1971, he found his refuge with Yoko in New York, the city in which he was nine years later to meet his fate. Hey, New York City, baby! Yeah, the last time I saw John, we were in Madison Square Garden. He said, uh, I can walk down the street, walk through the park, people pass me, hi John, and keep on walking. Instead of, hi John, oh, hold your breath please, blah, 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 blah. He said, I love it. And I thought to myself, John's found peace at last. Peace had come at a price. John's political activism had a real effect on young people. And the president himself saw Lenin as a threat. Nixon was determined to deny John his green card. There's a piece of tape somewhere of Nixon's henchman saying, you know, this guy could uh, sway an election. This is preserved. And the first step was to kick him out. And they were very eager to do that. Our life 
It's August 1980. With his struggle for permanent residence long behind him, John is about to embark on a new musical venture with Yoko. They're snapped, leaving the Dakota on the first day of recording their album, Double Fantasy. They can have no idea it will be their last. Their co-producer is Jack Douglas. The idea of this album was a play, a dialogue between a man and his wife, a man who had been through the 60s. It was about, well, here we are, we're turning 40, and everything's okay. We can still do this. We can still have our voice. We managed to make it through all those terrible years. And now let's look to the future. Well, hell, hell, even after all these years. By September 1980, the album Double Fantasy is nearing completion. I listened to it very intently. I saw the smile come on his face and he, he yelled out, Mother, tell him we have a record. Mother was John's nickname for his wife. He made me laugh all the time. I wasn't trying to make him laugh, but it seemed like he was laughing all the time about me. Just the fact that I'm saying something serious, and said, you're so tiny and you're saying these things, and you know, that made, made him feel funny, I suppose. To his fans, John could be kind. In November 1980, the fan later to take the last picture of John alive is granted his first photo opportunity. So he says, well, let's take it now. Let's get it the hell over with. You never know if we'll get another chance to do it. And this was 21 days before he gets murdered. So, I, I mean, I was like a kid, you know, under the Christmas tree on Christmas morning. And when I stood next to him, John put his right arm around my shoulder. And I couldn't believe that he pulled me to him. And when he did that, it gave me the idea, and I held on to his fur collar because I was holding it almost to make sure it wasn't a dream, like he wasn't going to disappear on me. The most iconic image of John Lennon in New York was taken by his friend, photographer Bob Gruen. On Friday, December the 5th, three days before he dies, John phones him. He was in a good mood, he was very playful. Uh, the next day, he asked me to come back because he had gotten a new jacket and he wanted some pictures in the new jacket, a, a very fancy Yamamoto jacket. And, um, and so we stayed up all night talking that night while they were working in the studio. And it wasn't until dawn that we actually were out on the street uh, Saturday morning, I think that was December 6th, and um, took a bunch of pictures there. And, um, and that was the last time I saw him there. Later that Saturday, December the 6th, John gives a radio interview to BBC DJ Andy Peebles at the Hit Factory Recording Studio in Manhattan. And there was my hero. I remember he immediately put his arm around my shoulder and said, thank you for coming. And I felt like saying, what do you mean, thank you for coming? When I left England, I still couldn't go on the street. Mm. It was still Carnaby Street and all that stuff was going on. We couldn't walk around the block, couldn't go to a restaurant, unless you wanted to go with the business of the star going to the restaurant garbage. I can go right out this door now and go in a restaurant. Do you want to know how great that is? And towards the end of the interview, for some perverse reason, it just flashed through my mind, ask him about security. And he came out with the classic quote, you know, I can walk down the street and people say, hi, John, how are you? How's the baby? And I can see him now saying it with such conviction. He could never, ever have dreamt what would ensue in 48 hours. Never, ever have dreamt. It's Monday, the 8th of December, 1980. At 10am, John Lennon leaves the Dakota building for his favourite local barber. He just wanted a haircut. I don't know, maybe I, I have those hairs still, I don't know. I used to keep his hair. Well, the day started with uh, Al Leibovitz's photograph. As the photographer Annie Leibovitz completes her photo shoot for Rolling Stone magazine and a cover that was to become world famous, John's fan, the amateur photographer Paul Goresh, arrives as usual. I got to the Dakota around 11.45 in the morning. And when I got there, it was, it was a nice mild day. It was for December 8th. The only other person there was a, a guy standing with a long overcoat with a fur collar and a fur hat. 
and he had a scarf on, and he was holding double fantasy under his elbow. And uh, he says to me, are you waiting for Lennon? And uh, I said, yeah. And uh, he said, my name's Mark, I'm from Hawaii. And I said, I'm Paul, I'm from New Jersey. And he said, oh. He said, do you work for him? I said, no. And he said, uh, I came all the way from Hawaii to get my album signed. So I said, where are you staying while you're in the city? And with that, he seemed to change his whole demeanor from like a, 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 a dope to an aggressive person. And he said, why do you want to know? And, and I told him, go back where you were standing and leave me alone. And uh, we would... Uh, we were doing this sort of uh, the interview. It was RKO uh, Radio, was it, you know? 12.40 p.m. The RKO Radio team from San Francisco with host Dave Sholin arrive full of expectation for the interview that lies ahead. We drive up to the Dakota, which is a very impressive building. I mean, it, it's, it takes your breath away. And then we're uh, ushered into uh, this incredible space, uh, this beautiful room where you take your shoes off, which is a wonderful custom, sit down on a couch, and Yoko was there, and uh, I noticed, I looked up at the ceiling and I saw this beautiful these clouds that were painted on, you know, lovely. Meanwhile, Paul Goresh goes inside, hoping to pick up the copy of John's 1965 book, A Spaniard in the Works, that he's left for John to sign. John was coming into the hall. He said, I'll sign it for you today, I promise. So I went back outside at my post, and uh, when I went back outside, the guy with the overcoat was there, and he was alone, again, on the other side of the archway. And he came over to me and he said, uh, you know, I, I want to apologize to you. He said, I owe you an apology for the way I acted. He said, but you're in New York, you never know who you can trust these days. Monday, December the 8th, 1980. It's 1.25 p.m. John Lennon begins a two and a half hour interview with radio journalist Dave Sholin. It's the last interview he'll ever give. The door opens and John appears, does this little jump, jumps up in the air and you know, proceeds to like say, here I am folks, you know, the show's ready to begin. He spreads his arms out and comes right over he could not have been more upbeat. In the interview, John ranges over his whole life story, from his Liverpool years to his relationship with Yoko and their son, Sean. He was born on October the 9th, which I was, so we're almost like twins. So now I have a sort of more reason to stay healthy and bright. People say I'm crazy. In 1978-9, around then, he was saying, you know, I feel very lonely because there's not a man that I can talk to uh, of being a house husband or being in a position of understanding about women and all that. And they must have some kind of, you know, a group session or something with those men. So I said, well, I suppose there should be. But I, I, we couldn't find one. And one day, I saw John sitting in bed and crying. And I said, what happened? And he was reading a book called The First Sex. And it's a book about how women did not get credit at all for what they did in history. And he said, I didn't know that we were doing this to women. So he has a very soft heart, you know. It seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that John came from a background that was very macho. Very macho. Oh, I was surprised. But you know, I think that was normal in those days for guys. When I was younger. This is the Liverpool pub where John used to meet his art school friends. One of these was Thelma Pickles. She was 16 and John 17. Well, of a romance, I suppose it was, in its way, a youthful romance. John lived here, in a house known as Mendips, with his aunt Mimi, who brought him up in the absence of his mother, Julia. 
Well, he got up to the kind of things that young people get up to. He had a very pristine bedroom. And he once told me, or asked me, did I know that making love, you expended the same amount of energy as going for a five mile run, which I didn't know. And I don't know to this day is true, but I believed him. Um, and then it became a euphemism. One evening, there was a party at the art school where they were both students. And he said, come on, let's go for a five-mile five run. So we went upstairs to the art history classroom. When we got inside, there were at least three other couples. And uh, I didn't realise at first. And then I said, I'm not staying here. And he absolutely whacked me one. And I didn't speak to him after that. I wasn't... I didn't care who he was, how interesting he was, how funny he was, how caring he was, how lovely he was. I was not going to be hit by a lad and continue a relationship. <laughs>